Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Galadriel. This is my monthly look at um, characters in the Lord of the Rings, the world of the Lord of the Rings. And I'm delighted to welcome one of the best people in the Lord of the Rings fandom, the Clueless Fangirl. Do you want to say hi? Hello, beautiful people. Excellent. And for those who do not know who you are, do you want to introduce yourself? No. Um, yes, my name is Helen uh, from the Clueless Fangirl channel. And, uh, you know, I kind of invited myself uh, to this ish in a way. Um, and yeah, because what do I love to talk about on my YouTube channel? Elves. Yes, you did basically <laughs> say that if I invited anyone else on, then you would cry. And uh, I, I sometimes try to be a nice human. So, um, I and I would never, ever that. talk to you again. Exactly. So uh, no. no. <laughs> uh, okay. So what I try to do, uh, we will get into Galadriel in just one moment. What I try to do is just give a little bit of a flavor of a few of the things happening in the wider world just before we kick off. Um, I did have uh, a couple of things have happened this week. No huge bits of news. Uh, one thing we did get confirmation from yesterday I think is that there is a new Witcher game which is in production Witcher 4 um, which I think I think you're a fan of the games aren't you Helen? Yes I played Witcher 3 and I loved it uh, I just uh, ordered a PlayStation 5 I'm not really sure if you can play it there actually you should have checked that maybe before hand uh, but yeah all the extension packs love the Witcher games Excellent. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I've sort of dabbled with The Witcher Three. It has to be said, without uh, ever really diving into it. But uh, I think it's probably still going to be a few years away. But this is good news generally that there's something in production. Yeah. Um, because they said they don't want to um, ever make or not ever. Don't use the, don't didn't use the term <laughs> ever. But they said for a really really long time they don't want to make a game. So I mean, with the success of the show, it makes sense. I think so. I think so. Absolutely. And it adds to this uh, kind of Witcher verse, which is being built up, yes. um, which is just not just the, the main TV show, but we've got a spin off happening later this year. We've got a few animes. Uh, and obviously now we've got uh, as well the, the books and more video games. Um, in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire, um, George R. R. Martin did another sort of update. Uh, not much news there other than a sort of a heavy hint. We will soon get a release date for House of the Dragon. I think that's increasingly looking likely to be the second half of the year now. Um, for those who are looking for clues for these kinds of things, we did also have an announcement of a, a book, a new sort of new book called Rise of the Dragon, which is a condensed version of uh, Fire and Blood Part 1, uh, but it's going to be coffee table sized, we're told, so big, and it has got 180 new pieces of art on it. And uh, this, so nothing new, I think, for, for people who are interested in the book itself, but there are some excellent artists involved in that. Magali Villeneuve, I'm a huge fan of, and also Ertach, who is... Uh, a wonderful artist sometimes in in the chat here as well so i don't know uh, whether whether they will make an appearance but uh, they they uh, he managed to do the cover as well so uh, when you see the cover then uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a little bit of us i think and a well deserved recognition um Right, let's get into Galadriel what i thought i would do was uh, start off by doing a sort of a a five-minute overview of just who she is, what her history is, and then Helen can tell me all of the bits that I'm being unfair on and the stuff I've missed out on uh, after that. So um, Galadriel is, as we know, she's an elf. She was born in Valinor before the ages of Middle-earth that we know, so way back in the years of the trees when all is good and right in the world. She is of the Noldor, and uh, she is of the noble house of the Noldor. So she is the granddaughter of Finway, who was the first... High King of the Noldor, also attached other side to uh, the Tellery, another one of the Elven uh, clans groups. Now, not much. We don't read much about the early years uh, from a story perspective. That 
it's actually quite boring. I suspect it was such a wonderful Nirvana over in Valinor that not much seems to have happened. However, we do get a bit of a description from Tolkien about her. She was tall, she was strong, she was athletic, as well as being wise and respected. Um, she uh, had, num as the elves often had a number of different names, one of them was Man Maiden as a sort of an expression of, of what she was, her athleticism was like. The big change happened with all of the Noldor when uh, we get uh, Morgoth and Ongoliant destroy the trees, steal the Silmarils, and Feanor leads the Noldor in revolt to go over to Middle-earth to try and chase down Morgoth and get the Silmarils back. Galadriel goes along. She's not a part of. She doesn't agree with it, with uh, with what's going on, but she is part of the Noldor, and she did indeed have within her heart. We'll perhaps talk about this a little bit more later. She had a desire to rule the sea lands and to rule them. So she headed off over to Middle Earth. The first age, she doesn't seem to do huge amounts. She goes to Doriath. We read about this in the Silmarillion. She has spent a lot of time with uh, Melian, the Maya there. Um, and she meets Celeborn, who she marries. The second age, Christopher Tolkien famously says that there is no part of the story that is more sort of confused and uncertain than what happens with Galadriel and Celeborn around the second age leading into the third age. J.R.R. Tolkien changed his mind a lot on exactly what happened. But we do know a few things that happened. They had a child, the two of them, um, that uh, she married uh, Elrond, so Galadriel's Elrond's mother-in-law. Uh, she was there. Um, she knew Celebrimbor, who was the guy who forged all these rings. Celebrimbor seems to have, have had a bit of a crush on her. And... Um, once Celebrimbor works out what's going on with the rings, he sort of goes to her for advice and she basically says, let's just distribute these as far and wide as we can so Sauron can't get them. She ends up with Nenya. Uh, she afterwards also heads off over to Lothlorien. She founds the kingdom over there or rules the kingdom over there, which is where we see her in the Third Age. At the end of the story of the Lord of the Rings, which I won't rehash because we all know it, she is there on that ship heading off to the west uh, with the other ring bearers. And hers is a story taking her from being this, this proud woman who was wanting to rule a land of her own to somebody who could see power within her hands. There's a fantastic scene with the ring that, tempting her and she resists. And at the end, she can then head back. So that's my potted version of, of Galadriel's story. But uh, Helen, what's your what's your take? What do you think are the sort of the big things that I missed out on there? <laughs> well, I think you mentioned it all. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, no. So overall, I think when people ask the question, why do you like Galadriel? Why is she for you or for Tolkien an important character? I think you mentioned a few important points. And one of the most important points, and you always realize that Tolkien really is into this character when there are literally three, four, five, six 9,000 versions of that character, right? Because this is an important story for him to tell. And Galadriel actually uh, went from a non-existent character to, after Feanor, the second most, I mean, name it powerful, influential, whatever you want to name it, the most important elf um, in the legendarium, right? Um, and that is a very bold statement, right, for a character who didn't exist in the beginning days of his writings, right? Um, and I do like because, um, you know, this is a story about war and about good versus evil, right? Um, but yes, in every, you know, literally on every page, first age, second age, any ages, this is about war. Um, and she's a female. And Tolkien, you know, being a child of his time, wrote a female during war times as one of the main and most important characters throughout all the ages. Yes, you know, she wasn't 
we don't know a lot about the first age, but she learned a lot in the first age. She learned magic as one of the only elves she could use magic, which she learned from a Mayar. So I really love that she, as one of the only people, has a full circle journey, right? Um, so she has a real character arc. She comes, you know, she's born in a very boring, perfect world to a very important royal house that will shape the fate of the world. All these characters from her family shape the fate of the first age, the second age, and all the ages to follow, right? Um, as elves, obviously. Um, but, you know, and then she went to those lands and she had her character arc. And in the end, she went home and had, in a way, her happy ending. Because, yes, I do think you're reuniting with her mother and her father who stayed back and who are still in Valinor. So she had, you know, her hero's journey she as you said she um mastered all her tasks she had a dream she fulfilled that dream so i really like that about that character because you don't have that very often in tolkien because he didn't have time to finish all the characters and to flesh out all the important characters look at erendil he's one of the most important characters but he didn't have time to flesh that poor man out and to to really tell his story although he always said that he is for him, this is where the Lord of the Ring and all the universe started for him with a story, with a poem about a mariner, right? Um, so I think that is really beautiful. And I think we, we will get lots of questions. Why is Galadriel all of a sudden so important in the show? And why do you find her so important? And I think that, yeah, that would be my answer to that. My long answer. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I love it. And I agree completely that the uh, the heart of this character is a character journey. This is that a lot of the elves, they seem to kind of stay on a level. Elrond always, we don't know what he was like in a lot of his early life, but he sort of stays yeah. on a kind of a wise and good level. Uh, Feanor stays at this kind of hot-headed, rash kind of but brilliant level. A lot of the elves stay roughly where they are. Galadriel, it's very clear, although she always had that wise and good side to her, when yeah. she started out, the, the descriptions that Tolkien uses of her is of somebody who, frankly, lusts after power, which is not yeah. something that he ever thinks is a good thing. And no. it's that journey up to the end with that fantastic scene when she's there with the, the speech about, uh, you know, you're, you're tempting me and what she could become. And she says no when she resists temptation. That's that's her journey. That's her arc. That's where uh, she, she gets to uh, a place of growth. It only took her a few thousand mm -hmm. years, but she did get there in the end. <laughs> You know, uh, what, <laughs> uh, yeah, in Trend yeah, Will's words, what, what are a few thousand years, you know? Um, well, don't get me started him. on Trend um, <laughs> No, but, but, but the thing is, look, I think you're right in a way to say, you know, she, she wanted those things and she was willful and prideful, yes, and Tolkien even says that. But one thing, imagine where she was born, and she was born to a very ambitious family in a very boring land, nothing ever happened in Valinor. It's basically Germany. So um, <laughs> so nothing ever happens in Germany. No, just kidding. But the thing is, look, nothing ever happens there. Just imagine you being a willful, you know, a very intelligent, a very wise, you know, coming from your father, um, elven maid, right, F born into this royal house. And then you don't have any chance. There are no opportunities for her. How would she ever rule anything in Valinor? Never. Her father was the youngest son, right? The, the third son, basically. He would never inherit. She was the youngest of four children. She had three older brothers. She would never inherit anything. So I really do think this wish of going to unknown lands to to experience something new is not really something bad i can understand that you know when i was 20 i wanted to conquer the world so i, I don't see Does it not as surprise a... me huh? <laughs> and i did spoiler no just kidding but but you know i i don't see this as something negative because a lot of people point out you know this willfulness and all that being negative i don't see it like that she had literally no other chance she needed to escape Valinor. And I think that was her reason because there was nothing there for her. Yeah, I think, well, I would definitely agree with that. I think it's not the willfulness that Tolkien 
um, plays up as a bad thing. It's the pride. Yeah. And her pride yeah. is very clearly a, a something that he is not a fan of. Um, no. Let's just ha had a quick uh, super chat. Thank you very much to uh, Roman Lakovets saying, unlike the clueless fangirl, I am truly clueless about Lord of the Rings. So my only <laughs> contribution today is appreciation for both of you and a couple of pennies. Well, well, thank you very much. I think that was a compliment to you, Helen. So I would I would take that as as that. Um, let's, as, as always, I will uh, try and frame this around questions from my patrons. I've got quite a few fantastic questions there. We'll try and pick up as many questions as we can in the chat as we're going through. Uh, but let's pick up uh, with a uh, question from um, Diego Godoy um, saying, Hola, Robert. Hola. Uh, why <laughs> wasn't Galadriel more... Di I love saying hola to uh, Diego. I don't know uh, why. Anyway, why wasn't Galadriel more directly involved in the events of The Lord of the Rings? Um, E.g. it seems that she was heavily involved in the events of the Second Age. Or do, do her actions in The Lord of the Rings play mostly off page what do you what what do you think uh to this one we'll sort of throw this to you first do you why she did seem to mostly stay in Lothlorien why do you think that was well I do think the White Council set up a actually good plan right and I and then later the Council of Elrond also set up a good plan and I do think her staying in Lorien if you look at the map I mean I don't think you're that tech magi today that you can put a map of the third no. age can you no okay good wishful thinking um here but anyway so just imagine you know the third age um map um of of middle earth and she and thranduil actually covered um the north and basically the north e uh, east yeah <laughs> bad at that uh, the north and the northeast so um they actually helped and they were battles especially thranduil fought battles but through her version of melian's girdle through um through um lorian and other things so she aided it's not written and it's not you know we don't have pages and pages about it but they covered um you know, they, they basically covered Gondor in that way and Rohan in a way as well. So they couldn't come from north and, and east. I mean, east Mordor, yes, but not from, from that side. So they covered those those flanks. I think they had, they took part. Yeah, I think so. And I think, so Gladriel did uh, sometimes come out from Lothlorien. We, obviously, there were the white, white councils when she was yeah. there meeting and discussing plans. There was also the attack on Dol Guldur, um, which they showed in the Hobbit movies as well. I don't think it turned, it was exactly like that, but the feel <laughs> of, like, this dream team of Gandalf and Galadriel and Elrond and possibly Gorfindel and a couple of Saruman all just sort of charging in, that was what happened. Uh, Sadly, Tolkien never actually described it in detail, but he told no. us that they all went in there. So yeah. um, she did get out. I, I think the thing is that when she was in Lothlorien, uh, she was, as you say, she was protecting it, and it was the Ring Nenya that was protecting it as much as anything else, that this was the, the great power of that ring, the same as power of the ring that Elrond had was protecting Rivendell, she was protecting Lothlorien. So I think certainly towards the end of the Third Age she probably felt she had to stay there to help protect Lothlorien. And it's it's probably worth as well as helping out randomly with the gifts um, and this is where Gandalf went incidentally. Again this sort of ha happens off camera so we don't think about it but when Gandalf comes back to life he gets taken by Eagle to Lothlorien mm -hmm. to recuperate. Yeah. So she's again supporting yeah. what's going on there. And um, it's worth also noting Lothlorien got attacked several times. Mm -hmm. Well, our focus is all on what's going on down in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields in Minas Tirith. Actually, orcs were attacking up into Mirkwood, into Lothlorien, places like that. So she was needed there. So it's not as if she was just like abandoning everyone and just letting the story go. She had her own role and she was playing that one out, uh, I think, yeah. quite successfully. And she even, super fun fact, uh, she even aided in the third age, um, Eol the Young. Um, they, um, you know, they had to ride very fast. Uh, and I think the, the Wayne Riders, I, I'm not really sure, I forgot who attacked them. But um, she sent uh, some mist and that mist made the horses 
super, super, super fast, uh, <laughs> light speed fast, whatever. Um, and so they could reach the battle in time. So she did, you know, play her part. You know, it's not talked about a lot. And it's funny because um, the Rohirrim actually are afraid of her, right? Um, and this is a fun fact that she actually aided them without them knowing. Yes, absolutely. So she is there from afar. And she probably threw, we'll talk about the mirror of Galadriel in a moment, but she probably saw a lot of things that were going yeah. on through the mirror of Galadriel and yeah. helped in ways that people didn't appreciate. Yeah. Let's move on to a question from Bo Barnett uh, saying, Robert, I would like your thoughts on Amazon seeming to make Galadriel the central figure in the Rings of Power uh, to the point of overshowing other key players. Uh, so let's let's pick up on this one to start with. So um, I don't know if I've, 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 I've asked... Uh, on camera at least what your thoughts are on on the rings of power what we've seen so far um i will start by saying that we uh, we haven't seen much yet we obviously haven't seen the show itself we've just seen a teaser trailer so i personally i think it's too early to sort of draw any conclusions on who is the main character or anything along those lines i think they're presenting this as being an ensemble cast um they i think they are going to use galadriel as our entry point because this is a character that we know the audience as a whole is aware of. And so I think that they will use that as a, a hook to get us in rather than just lots of people that we've never heard of. So that's, or maybe, maybe we've heard of them, but, but the wider audience won't have heard of them. Galadriel, everyone has. So I think they will probably use her as a hook to get us into the story to start with. I suspect, although she will be a central character, probably not the central character but what what's what's your sort of take on that all yeah. the rings of power well, more broadly <laughs> oops um how long do we have now just kidding um i was uh, actually yesterday on uh signum university's um stream uh, and i talked to Corey olsen well you know one of my personal heroes um and he, we talked about the timeline compression about Numenor. What do we, you know, I mean, there are 25 rulers, kings and queens, and how this kind of confirmed timeline compression, because this will all take place in a shorter time span. Definitely not 3,432 years. Um, so, and yes, that can be problematic because, you know, a especially the Numenor, but also when we come to the elves, you know, a lot happened. A, a region was founded, you know, um, Linden rose to power, like all these Gilgalad came into power, like all these things happened, right? Um, and you need to kind of tell this story and you can't tell it in a flashback or like too many flashbacks, 10, 20 flashbacks take you out of the story. I don't think that would work for me personally. I mean, somebody and weird timelines you know like in the witcher <laughs> season one might also not work for people who have no clue um I like so, that. <laughs> uh, oh, well yeah because you read the books but i do think for a lot of people it was problematic and they were like what yes. i don't understand this um you know so stop being uh no but the thing is um to to come back to galadriel i i do so for the show, I'm I'm positive. You know, literally, we saw a what one minute trailer. Um, I I'm not judging a, a book by its cover. It's it's not even a cover we got right. So I'm you know yeah I, I'm not super happy about the timeline compression, but it is what it is. Let's see. So I don't want to lose too much uh, time talking about that. But Galadriel. I'm not mad about her playing one of the major roles. I don't think there's one, you know, major role. I think that they, there'd be like two, three, four, five, you know, definitely a human, definitely a dwarf, definitely one or two elves. But the elves are the immortal ones, except, you know, they die like all of Galadriel's family. Um, but she is the link between all the ages. She is the link that can tell the story of the beginning days of the elves. And she's the link to literally the elves leaving at the end of the third age, right? So she is the storyteller and she wasn't the storyteller for nothing during, you know, 
the OG Lord of the Ring movies when she had her epic, you know, um, prologue. And I'm I'm not mad about that. She is, as we mentioned, you know, in the beginning of the stream, she is so important in the Legendarium. She comes from this important line who shaped the fate of the world. Um, and she has beef with Sauron because he killed her brother. I, I think this is not talked about enough here because this is really important she's not just you know anti-evil this person literally killed her brother um, and was also responsible for her two other brothers death and you know um, Gilgalad was a close relative of her he killed him as well so you know she she has uh, she has her own issues with Sauron who obviously hopefully <laughs> will be the uh, uh, antagonist here in this series. So I I'm not mad about her playing um, an important, uh, one of the most important uh, roles. No, neither am I. I, th I think she she is one of the most important characters, and so she should be central. And I just think I, I don't want to spend too much time on the Rings of Power like you. I, I think we've not had enough information yet to draw much of a judgment. I think the thing I would say is that if you look at the people who know the most about Tolkien, like the Tolkien professor and other people mm. of that ilk, the thing that that they are most concerned about is this timeline compression, yes. which is the thing that I'm the most concerned yeah. about, and I know you are. Uh, yeah. So um, there's a lot of kind of... Uh, fire and lightning and thunder about this but actually if you wish to be a Tolkien purist about it then that is the thing which is probably the most uh, concerning um that yeah. doesn't mean it's not gonna be a fun series but it's that's the probably no. the biggest change from Tolkien law yeah because look the second age is and this will be the second age right this is the rise and downfall of Numenor which is you know Atlantis but in a way also Babylon it represents a lot of things that happened in our own history right um and i do think this this downfall of this you know chosen human race and then because it wasn't Sauron and this is what I talked with Corey, uh, Corey about it wasn't Sauron he was literally there the last 50 years they destroyed you know they they, they were responsible for their downfall themselves partly right yes you know the Valar made a mistake in setting them there there were lots of things but still they effed it up themselves right it wasn't just they couldn't blame Sauron for it and um the thing it started way earlier and um the thing is you need to tell that story because this is the essence of the second age right and then because then only then a character arc like Aragorn and a character like Aragorn who is very humble who's not like the kings of old who's definitely not like Arpharazon right he's humble he is he learned his lesson um and um that is so important. And if you don't tell the story of how Numenor, you know, fell and how that could have happened to a chosen promised island and race, that is important. And I don't know if you can do that with too much time compression and just a few ages because they can just show one or two kings. But the decline of the kings, you know, coming from Elros to down to 25 or 24 later to Arpharazon is pretty pivotal to the story it, it is what i uh what i don't know as i say we will move on from it this is just one second but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it is an interesting subject uh what i don't know is when they have talked about time compression and there clearly will be time compression the bit that they have talked about is what i think they call something like the major events of the second age which are the things that we know that the forging of the rings the rise of sauron uh the fall of numenor the um, the last alliance of elves and men those kinds of things um they broadly speaking happen in the second half of the second yeah. age yeah. um at, at least you know you've got a thousand years or more when mm -hmm. no one even knows where sauron is now what may i don't know i've no idea what they may do is okay so the first half does happen we can have 1500 years or so where we can have the rise of Numenor as a, a state and it can start to fall um and it's just that last bit that they're compressing I don't know that would make more sense to me than saying the entire second age took place over 30 years or whatever yeah uh, but we will probably have to wait and see on this um still mm -hmm. as you say there are if, if they do compress the second half into 
a short period of time that has its own difficulties but there are slightly yeah. fewer difficulties than if you're trying to compress the entire three millennia down yeah no um had uh the red book in the chat hi there uh with uh had uh, had Matt on two two months ago a month ago I can't remember when it was but a fantastic channel please do go and check that out I wonder whether one of the moderators could put a link in uh, the description uh, or in the into the chat um, saying hello to you both please share your thoughts on Celeborn the Wise is this a victim of Tolkien's unfinished text and what text uh, what makes him worthy of that title well this is a, a really fun question because this is his super cat this is what he's he's given uh, Celeborn the wise and yet i think any honest reading of the lord of the rings makes you go he doesn't really seem that wise um he's no he's <laughs> particularly standing next to galadriel who at this point is wise and he's he's not he he doesn't seem particularly nice particularly towards dwarves he seems to have a very long-standing grudge against dwarves and he doesn't understandably yeah, he says few, understandably uh, let's not get into that unless people want us to but we both know you're in the wrong <laughs> um but the uh the, he says a few good things but nothing that makes you go wow this person's wise um so the question is, why does Tolkien call him that? Um, and I, I think uh, Red Book says, uh, uh, is this a, a victim of Tolkien's unfinished text? And I think that's probably a shorthand way of saying uh, that he Tolkien had hoped to expand him out into a, a bigger character, but he changes his mind. I actually got up this quote because I think it's worth as context for everything about Galadriel and Celeborn in the Second Age, a bit of the Third Age as well. Um, this is Christopher Tolkien, who I think indisputably everyone would say know, knew more about his father's writing than anyone else. He starts a chapter entitled The History of Galadriel and Celeborn in the Second Age in the Book of Unfinished Tales with this wonderful sentence. There is no part of the history of Middle-earth more full of problems than the story of Galadriel and Celeborn. And it must be admitted that there are severe inconsistencies embedded in the traditions. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and da 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 her story underwent continual refashionings. So um, basically, uh, Christopher Tolkien started his explanation about the story of Galadriel and Celeborn by saying, yeah, my father changed his mind a lot, so we can't really come to a, a strong conclusion. So um, I think I think my answer is that, yes, this is Tolkien. Uh, one, in one of his many ideas of where he was going with this, had this idea that Celeborn would be the big wise person. And then never really expanded on it, but the name yeah. survived. Do you have a yeah. sort of any additional take on that? Yeah, well, I mean, he was given two um, tasks, which could be, but but I do think they mainly came from the order came from Galadriel, so you can question that. So there was one thing. There are ver various versions. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But this is one of the most interesting times when they find uh, find when they found Eregion, um, and there are versions of it's either Galadriel and her husband founding it, and um, Celebrimbor is just basically accompanying them, and then. There is, you know, like something happening like on the bounty, it's um they they rebel um against the Guaita Mirdain with Celebrimbo, rebel against Galadriel and Celebon, and then Galadriel leaves, but he stays behind. And this is really interesting because he could leave with her. I mean, yeah, he didn't want to go through Moria, but seriously you know, go a bit further up north and you can still um, go to Lorien. Um, but the thing is, he stayed. And I do think he stayed behind to, you know, keep either Caleb a watchful eye on what the Guetha Mirdan and Sauron and Celebrimbo are doing. And I love this version um, of the Eregion story. And so you could, you know, you, you could question this is, or you could say or add this to his wise list, but I do think because before it is said Galadriel, you know, made contact with the dwarves of Moria, which again was very foresighted because she understood they needed the dwarves as well. Um, and so I do think that was one of his 
tasks. And then the other one was, you know, at the end of the um of the third age when him and Thranduil, you know, basically they they split Markwood, they split the lands, and they kind of, you know, set up the world or Middle Earth for 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 the next stage of the world, right? Um, and then they sailed away, uh, but uh, just after a time. So he stayed there behind, you know, to organize everything, basically. So that was also one of his jobs and deeds. But to be called wise or like foresight for nah, I think that was her role. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think this is just a. A leftover thing from one of the strands of Tolkien's writing. He, did, yeah. he had many, many strands of, of writing about lots of yeah. these different characters. Yeah. Um, Callum Barnes saying, no question, just love and support to you both uh, while chatting about one of my favourite Tolkien creations. So uh, thank you uh, very much for that. Um, let's go to a question. Um, in fact, actually, this was the second half of this question from Bo Barnett uh, saying, if Galadriel had taken the ring from Frodo, do you think she could have overthrown mm. Sauron? Uh, love your channel, Roll Tide. I don't know what Roll Tide is. I'm going to guess that's an American thing. Um, uh, Helen doesn't know either. Um, what, what do you What do you think on this one, Helen? Do you think that uh, Do you think Galadriel could have taken on Sauron? Okay, so I personally do think so. Why? Not Not always, right? But um. Third age Sauron at that time when she herself had Nenya and Sauron obviously didn't have the ring at that time. I do think she could have, and not because she was such a powerful elf and da da da. I do think, and not just because of the power of the ring, I do think the tricks Melian taught her. I made a cool video about, you know, the top 10 elven warriors, and Galadriel is in there, not because, you know, she can yield uh, the, the sword um, as, I don't know, Excellion can, um, but because she has this magic ability and power. And look back at what Luthien did to Sauron. Um, she basically, you know, um, teared down um, Tol Ingauroth um, at the end. And she was so powerful. And uh, yes, she was a half Maya. Galadriel obviously is not that. But she used the same magic Melian taught her. And Galadriel, we know Melian told Galadriel, taught Galadriel this magic, as well as um, uh, her brother, um uh, uh, Finrod. Finrod, yeah, <laughs> um, and so I do think having this magic ability, being able to, you know, use the ring in a different way than all the other um, ring bearers could, because she had these magic powers and knows how to use magic like a Maiar. Um, I do think so, because Sauron was without the ring at that time. Yeah, I find this an interesting one. Um, she was powerful. She was the most powerful of the Noldor left after Feanor had gone. Tolkien's very clear about that. Um, Sauron was at a higher level, being a Maya. Um, but as you say, he was um, significantly weakened by that point. Um, I did have a quote. I wish I could find where I got this quote from. This is from Tolkien, uh, but I did this. I picked this from a previous video of mine. Uh, it says, of the others, only Gandalf might be expected to master Sauron, being an emissary of the powers and a creature of the same order, an immortal spirit taking a, vis a visible physical form. In the mirror of Galadriel, it appears that Galadriel conceived of herself as capable of wielding the ring and supplanting the Dark Lord. If so, so also were the other guardians of the three, especially Elrond. But this is another matter. It was part of the essential deceit of the ring to fill minds with imaginations of supreme power. Mm. So I think my, my take from that is she thought she could. I think that's the first thing is that she definitely thought when she was being tempted, she thought that she could rule the world with this if yeah. she had it. Um, and Tolkien sort of says that doesn't necessarily mean that she was right in that. Um, the only person that he was pretty sure definitely could be on a par with Sauron was Gandalf because they were both my art. Um, but Galadriel, I always find it's... Um, if she could get other people onto her side and gather them together and then go attack Sauron, yeah. I think perhaps she could if she was clever about it, which she probably would be. So I think 
I think on a pure power level, probably no. But I think that if she had a gang of people around her, then I don't see why not. That's, uh, that's sort of where I'm at. But talking... Which they did with the White Council at, what, at yes. one point. Um, I mean, that was in Dil Guldur. So, yeah, it, to, all of them together did push him out. Sauron was even weaker at that point, it has to be said. Um, yeah. But, uh, yes, they did. All, all of them managed to push him out. Um, and there probably were a few Nazgul hanging around there at the time as well. It, it wasn't just sort of uh, Sauron there in sort of an ethereal form, just sort of wafting around. Um, this was a proper fortress. Uh, okay, let's go to, I think I had another question. Uh, this is uh, Reflective Rambling. Um Thank you very much. Uh, so, hi there, by the way. Saying radio announcer voice. I, I don't know if this is me saying I'm supposed to put on a radio announcer voice or, or, or whether this is you, but I will interpret this in radio announcer voice. Not enough Galadriel for you, question mark. Friend of channel and uh, birthday man, uh, Voice of Geekdom has a wonderful video on Galadriel pre Lord of the Rings. Well, there you go. Uh, Dan, I don't think you're watching. At least I hope you are having fun rather than watching this. Uh, but uh, uh, have a very happy birthday. If people do not know Voice of Geekdom, he's got another excellent Lord of the Rings channel. And do go and check out that video. I'm sure somebody will drop a link to it in the chat. Um, I did that video with him. We talked about Galadriel. Oh. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, mm -hmm. even more reason. You were not my firsts on uh, Robert. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what to say to that. Um, oh. uh, I, I have also made a video about Galadriel, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, but I just I wasn't going to mention it until then. But now it was. Oh uh, man! Go and watch theirs first. Uh, there you go. Um, right, let's um, let's go to a question, and I know you wanted to answer this one first. Uh, the Children of Jack Acid says, "What are some bad things that Galadriel did?" Did she ever treat the Sylvan Elves like her inferiors? Did she ever talk smack about dwarves or humans or other <laughs> elf races? Did she ever have to make tough decisions and sacrifice the welfare of others for her own people? Did she make mistakes that cost lives? Was she ever tempted to have dalliances? So um, <laughs> uh, you, you did tell me beforehand you wanted to answer this one first, so I shall, uh, uh, I shall just hand it over to you and say, tell me all the evil deeds that Galadriel did. Zero. <laughs> no, like, so, like, okay, seriously, um, zero, okay, but okay, let's let's uh, go a bit deeper. So she is because a lot of people, you know, were like, okay, why is she actually even ruling in Lorien, right? So you know, the Cinder, they are originally from the there were three original houses of the elves or clans or whatever you want to call them, right? So the Vanyar, the Teleri, um, and the Noldor. And those are the Cinder, are Teleri, who never made it basically to the Undying Lands, who just stayed behind in Middle-earth. Um, so they are dark elves. Um, and her ruling over them actually is not that wrong because she is half Teleri. Her mother, Earvin, is a princess of the house of the Teleri, right? So she's half Teleri. Um, and I don't, so why would she even, and you can see that closeness in her and her brothers being as the only Noldor princes and princesses. Is it plural princesses? Pr princess? Yes. Pr <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, and princesses being allowed in Doriath because Thingol really did not like the Noldor, right? Um, and so he was allowing them due to them being half Teleri um, from their mother's side. Um, he was allowing them, uh, you know, to stay in Doriath, to mingle, you know, with his people there, Melian to teach them, yada, yada, yada. So why would she ever, you know, talk smack or I, I don't know what the phrase was um about about them she was half uh Teleri herself I think people sometimes forget that uh yeah so I mean I think I would probably agree that she didn't do any obviously bad or evil things um the what uh I mean I've got a quote here this is from the that bit of the, the oh my god, you tales. looked up a quote to find, to find proof she did. 
No, I did not. Not in order to find it. It was just I, I knew that this was okay. there, and I thought this with this. Okay. Um, so Galadriel's evil side is not manifested in evil acts, but it, in, in it's a sort of a personality thing within herself. Um, mm -hmm. By by which I, I mean this. This is what Tolkien said. She was proud, strong, and self-willed, as were all the descendants of Finway, save Finarfin. She had dreams of far lands and dominions that might be her own to order, as she would without uh, her own to order as she would without tutelage. In Feanor, she perceived a darkness that she hated and feared, though she did not perceive that the shadow of the same evil had fallen upon the minds of all the Noldor and upon her own. So, Tolkien is very clear that there is a shadow of evil upon. Uh, Gladriel, that she is proud, that she wants to rule. It's not just she wants to rule because she thinks that she could be a wise and enlightened leader. She wants to rule without tutelage. She doesn't want anyone teaching her and telling her how to do it. She wants to be her own boss. These are not yeah. um, good facets of her personality. Um, but I think it's probably to her credit that this doesn't really come out much mm -hmm. maybe it was in those years of the first and second age where we don't know huge amounts about what happened with her maybe something did come out there but i do my bit of um head canon for what happened with melian is that actually uh when in the first age when we had that long period of time when she seems to sort of just spend a lot of time hanging out in doriath chatting with amaya yes she learned stuff yes she learned some magic but the the bits that it intersects the story that we have in the silmarillion is that the, the only really significant passage is when melian kind of wheedles out of her what happened yeah. in uh, back in why why are the Noldor suddenly yeah. come back from Valinor <laughs> and it's very clear that for probably centuries she was just like I'm not telling anyone what happened I'm just like just, yeah. nothing I'm not I just uh, you just have to trust me you don't want to and and it seems to me that if anything she had I don't know whether it's PTSD whether she was traumatized but mm. if you imagine she did come from this idyllic start and then suddenly she yeah. immediately goes th gets thrown into one side of her family mercilessly killing the other yeah. side of her family, then yeah. she heads off uh, across, follows what she feels she has to do, crosses the Helcaraxa, which is basically the North Pole, and sees loads of her people just dying from cold mm. and starvation and, and whoever else, whoever knows what else. Um, when she arrives in Middle Earth, she she I just get the feeling she's shattered. It's just that there's just so much has happened, and then she is just she just has to relax for a bit, and and yeah. uh, she doesn't want to talk about it. So that's my kind of take: is that she she had all these feelings inside her, and so the time with Melian was the start of her growing to um, a sort of more more maturity, less proud. At the end of the first age, she was still proud. Tolkien's very clear yeah. that this is why she stayed in Middle Earth. That she, all, the Noldor, were basically excused and said, "You can come back now." But she yeah. stayed in Middle Earth, and that was her pride. Uh, but um, she didn't, and I think it's to her credit, she didn't seem to follow through on any of these kind of this evil shadow that's in her. No. And that was also her, you know, that, that was also her journey and part of her, you know, journey to withstand that. Because I do think from Finwa's line also does come darkness in a way. And um, the, and the thing is, I don't, I think she also, because she was still close, you know, to Fingolfin's line as well. And her brothers especially were, they even were close, right? Um, Fingon was close to Medros, right? So that they were all still their fates were still you know in interwoven intertwined intertwined yeah, yeah sorry I would <laughs> having some um intertwined and they were still friendly with each other um they didn't they i mean thingol obviously wanted you know um them not to be but they 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 had this union of medros and all those things they were still friendly after feanor's death um it wasn't always easy but they were still one family and i don't think she wanted to go against because at that time it was fingolfin ruling the family and then after him you know fingon turgon yada 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 down the line 
line. And I think she didn't want to go against those people. She cared for those people as well. Um, and yes, she was not in the host, but, you know, Fingolfin, Fingon, Turgon, those people, they fought against the Teleri. They took part, not willingly, not knowingly, but they took part in the kid slaying. So um, I think she also didn't want to tell the story because she didn't want to, you know, Maybe it was PTSD. Maybe it is what you say because she didn't want to realize that those people she's so close with did that. Yeah, I, I think so. And and there's, it, it's just it, whatever it was, there was some degree of trauma. I think. That's, yeah. Uh, that prevented her from saying yeah. stuff for a very, and very long time. She never experienced anything like that. Looked like people who were born in. I mean. Thingol himself, he was born in Quivian and he saw the Undying Lands, he came back, he has seen things, she didn't, she was born in a blissful world where nothing ever happens, so how, and then you experience this kin slaying and you're like, what is happening, um, yeah, so... Yeah, um, but to, to come back to her and her um, challenges she had and some questionable things, I think one, one thing um, that stands out, and I want to see that portrayed, and I mentioned it before a teeny tiny bit, um, so the whole thing in Eregion and the thing with Gilgalad, Celebrimbo, her having the rings and everything, I do think, because there's a passage, sadly I, I didn't bring it, but there's a passage where Tolkien tells us about Sauron setting up Celebrimbo against Gilgalad and Galadriel and Elrond. He literally says and uses the words, okay, don't you, wh why do you think they don't want you to be as powerful as their land? Why don't they want Eregion to be as powerful as Linden? Da, 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 da. Um, so he sets, you you know, those close related people and friends up against each other with words. Um, he's he's very clever with that. And I do think there was a time when Galadriel and Celebrimbo and, you know, maybe even Gilgalad when there was a problem and when they, you know, obviously, you know, they, they were not threatened to kill each, they didn't threaten to kill each other. And, you know, Celebrimbo came to his senses. But I do think there was a time when it wasn't so um, peaceful and harmonious in, in that family. And they did yeah. have a, a lot, lot of f fighting and, you know, discussions and whatnot. Um, so that that's an interesting time time for her. And maybe we will see that in the show. And one th last thing about her not doing the right thing is, we mentioned it before, why did they not hunt down the shadow leaving Dol Guldur? Because they saw that and they should have, they shouldn't have accepted. They must have learned from all the ages before. Those people never leave because she knows, she knows those spirits, you know, whatever, even if they didn't fully know and realize who it was, they should have hunted, they should have kept looking right and they didn't fully do that they had the power at that time um with the aid you know of of other realms and they they didn't they just sat on their asses and it, no they should have hunted him down i don't understand I, I why agree. they didn't i agree i i mean i just i i recently rewatched the hobbit movies and they had an answer for it there which i i meant and i yeah. forgot to double check whether this was actually backed up by anything which was uh yeah. what happened in the movies was that galadriel basically she's she bosses it out but then gets completely uh, she uses up all her energy yeah. and she needs to recuperate and yeah gandalf has obviously got another thing he needs to be heading off to and then elrond's there saying no okay we need to get you back and to recover and so yeah. he kind of understood all right well that kind of makes sense why they're not following him but I, I don't think I don't think it's anywhere. Um, but I'm very happy. There are always more clever people in the chat. So if any of you know, uh, then do let me know. But I can't think that it's anywhere that that is what actually happened. Yeah. No. And we um, don't know how magic works, right? We don't know. Was she really, you know, like uh, uh, like the child in the, the Mandalorian, like Grogu? Is he then sleeping for five years or five days? I don't, we don't know how magic works and malleable well, magic. 
well, no, we know a little bit in as much as when Gandalf um, uses magic, but noticeably when he uses it against the Balrog, he says basically, and I don't know the exact he, quote, and this is not the words that Tolkien used, but I'm now yeah. knackered, um, which was yeah. like, I, I've used up a <laughs> lot of my energy doing this. I can't do anything else right now. Yeah. Um, and I think that, so that does kind of add up for me anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hannah Hersko, thank you very much, saying, hi, I love both your channels. Thank you. How do you think the Valar communicated to Galadriel that her ban had been lifted and she can go back to Valinor? Also, how did they know that Frodo and Bilbo could go to Valinor? Um, oh, interesting questions. I'll, uh, I'll throw the second one to uh, Helen in just one moment. In the first one, um, the... I, th I think it's it's got a reasonably clear-ish answer, which is that the the War of Wrath at the end of the First Age, we get told that the host of Valinor comes over. Now, we're not told exactly who was in the host. It may be that some of the Valar themselves came over. Some Someone like Tolkus mm. is always up for a fight. So I think that it's entirely possible that some of them came over. Even if they didn't, we do know um, that, um, and I've forgotten his name, the, the Herald of Manwe um, uh, was there. Uh, Helen, do you mm. remember what's his name? No, but no, yeah, he was well. there. But he was and definitely the there. And the firstborn son of the um, Vanyar king of, um, for, sorry, it's really late. Um, he was also there. He was sent to lead the, the Vanyar who were going there. So the king himself didn't come, but his firstborn son did. Yeah. So Don't there were, remember his name. There were, at the very least, emissaries of the Valar there who came over and quite possibly some of the Valar themselves. were. We, uh, Aeonwe. Aeonwe, yes. Excellent. Very good. Um the, the second part of the question there I was going to throw over to you was how did they know, and I think this goes double for Legolas knowing that it would be okay to bring Gimli, but how did uh, how did they know that it was okay to bring uh, Frodo and Sam across to Valinor? Well, because they were ring bearers and, you know, they, they had that burden and they aided and we know um, that, you know, People who who aided in those tasks, um, they were allowed in the Undying Lands, but they don't. They do die. It's not like you know, Arfarazon thought once, uh, you don't die there. That's not the meaning of the Undying Lands. Um, no. Uh, so I think the so humanity cannot cross over. So I think the the issue because there was the clear ban there. Uh, the issue is why, how they knew it was okay for the hobbits. We say yes, they're the ring bearers, and that's the thing that uh, that they get told. You're the ring bearers. You, um, yeah. to my mind, that doesn't necessarily completely add up as the full answer. I think that they probably did need some, uh, maybe Curdan, who was far sighted. Maybe he could sort of see and understand that yes, this is they would be welcome as well. Um, but I, th I think Gimli's the one that always struck me as the slight oddity because he doesn't even have this ring bearer thing going for him. Um, uh, and yeah, he's not a human, but you know, there's no indication that the dwarves are ever supposed to be going over there either. So it's a bit of a mystery, uh, but I think that it's just the Valar kind of made last exceptions for them because this was going to end soon anyway. Yeah, and the thing is, you couldn't question why was Earendil in a way allowed in at one point, and you can even question maybe Amandil's ship ma even made it there. And again, Arfarazon reached the Undying Lands. I mean, he's buried till today, uh, you know, in the cave, but he made it to the Undying Lands. Um, so th it's not impossible. And I do think, yeah, this was a gift of um, the Valar for people who did good, because this is what Earendil did. He pleaded, and in the end, I know he was a half elven, but you always have to remember Earendil identified as a human. He would have been a human and choose the human fate, if not for his wife. Um, so just because of Elwing, he chose to be immortal. Um, but he identified as a human coming to, to the Undying Land. So there were exceptions. There were, I, just as a complete aside, I love that this bit in the story of Irendil when he arrives and it's just this uh, fantastic sort of moment. He, he 
he's been on this epic voyage, struggling across the sea. <laughs> he's obsessed. He thinks this is it. He's probably going to be killed on sight. He tells everyone, yeah. stay on the boat, don't come in. And he goes in and it's deserted. And it's like, where are you all? Yeah. <laughs> What's going on? Where yeah. is everyone? And he walks. And it, it, you get this. Um, this kind of feel is like the twenty-eight days later kind of feel as he's like wandering around yeah. these empty streets, going, "Where is?" And they've all gone off to have a big festival party. Yeah. Uh, and they sort yeah. of like eventually someone spots him. But there is this moment when he's like, "Yeah, I've come all this way, and they're not even here." Um, I know. He's like, "This actually... is not what they told me it would be like." No, it's it's really quite um, comical. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's go to um, uh, question. So Dan McKay saying, this is just a thought. Who is the poor actress who has to try and fill Kate Blanchett's shoes in the new series? I'm sure she will do great, but those are very big shoes to fill. Uh, what a perfect performance Kate gave in the films. Well, um, I mean, I think we can all agree that Kate Blanchett did an astonishing uh, job. Um, the person who is going to be playing young Galadriel is uh, Morfith Clark, who most people don't know. You may well have seen her in something, though, because um, I did a sort of a little, as you do when this name comes up, so where is this person? And she's been in a lot of things that you may have seen if you watched his dark materials she was in that um she was in a very non-galadriel kind of role as a rather frumpy nurse uh there um and uh if you saw the stephen moffat mark gatiss uh, dracula she was in that she was mina harker i think she's been in the alienist she's been in the recent david copperfield film which is excellent if you ever get a chance to see that so she's been in a lot of things you may well have seen her um and i've heard very good reports of some stage performance that she's performances that she's done as well but um i think uh, helen we can probably agree that yes these are huge shoes to fill yeah and you know i always thought that Kate had this ethereal, outer, worldly fae, you know, she put, I, I mean, it's her looks, but also the way she moves and her voice and everything. Although I think she's an Aussie, actually. And I do mm -hmm. think, Morford, I, I read a tweet, somebody tweeted this, that Tolkien would have loved alone the name Morfid, so he would have been okay <laughs> with somebody from, I think she's Welsh, uh, from Wales, you know, playing uh, playing that role with that name. Um, but no, joking aside, I mean, that poor girl. But I do think look-wise, and the, when she read, because we heard her speaking, you know, when she said the epic, you know, Mordor came, blah, 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 uh, words in the first little snippet we got I don't really remember what she said but she read some lines oh did she read the ring verse I don't really remember what did she read did she read the ring uh, verse? no I think it was a bit of the same thing that was from the beginning of that the flashback sequence at the beginning of the fellowship of the ring um, oh from the okay yeah I think that's what it was yeah but that was really good so her voice and I think she she pleasantly surprise us, and you know we have to take this as this is not a contender of the OG movies. This is not a real prequel to the OG movies. I see this as a standalone thing. I agree, and I think that uh, she we we shouldn't. It would be unfair to try and compare her, and I think that we also have to accept, as we were talking about this idea of this character arc and journey. This is a different Galadriel. It's the same Galadriel, yes. but this is a younger Galadriel. Uh, so not somebody who's just going to be sort of airy-fairy in Lothlorien saying wise words and giving out gifts. This no. is somebody who clearly yep. was moving about Middle-earth a huge amount. The amount of travel, whichever version of Tolkien's explanation of what she was up to during that time you take, she did a huge amount of travel during that time, so yes. she's going to be out and about. She's certainly got a whole load of those things uh, that we read about from when she was younger, I'm sure, the pride, the, the willfulness, those kinds of things, uh, and the athleticism is very clearly going to be there as well. So this is going to be a different performance, and we shouldn't compare the two, um, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, huge shoes to fill, but um, Good luck to her. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, let's go to um, 
question from, well, this is about the Kate Blanchett uh, version. This is Mara Lee. Hi there, Mara. Actually, you had, I think you did a super chat before we went on air saying just a show of love, support and appreciation for all the fabulous content on IDG and stories on the Well Told Tale. You are the best love to Dan, your gorgeous dog. Well, thank you very much. Dan appreciates it as well, I am sure. Um, uh, and you did a super stack. Super, uh, super stack. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Mara. You know how much I appreciate your support and i know many other people in this community do you're a wonderful gift to us all um and you're asking about gifts saying uh, my question is about the various gifts that galadriel gave to each of the members of the fellowship could you please go into detail about the gifts and why she decided to give them to each of the members of the fellowship did it have to do with the gift of foresight or something else um well let's go through these um why don't you? Uh, I, I got up the list in front of me just in case I forget any of them. Uh, but the, the <laughs> gifts that them. they got, yeah, it's only fair. I, this is exactly the kind of thing that you forget, and then it just gets very annoying. Uh, so everyone got elven cloaks with the elven brooches and the lembas bread uh, there. Sam got some rope, um, and then they all got given the boats as well. But then afterwards, they each got individual gifts. Uh, Aragorn got the elf stone and a sheath for Anduril, his sword. Um, Boromir got a golden belt. Merry and Pippin got silver belts. Um, Legolas got a cool new bow um, with strung with elf hair. Um, Sam got that box with the uh, the silver nut for the melon tree. Um, uh, it's my favorite got... gift. Yes, I think mine too, actually. Gimli got three strands of her hair and Frodo got the file of Galadriel. Um, we'll talk about the three strands of hair in just a moment because I've got another mm. question there. Um, is there any of them you want to sort of pick up on? Are there anything that you particularly wish to talk about? Do you want yeah. to talk about the, the gift to Sam then? Yes, because this is so... This is such a beautiful thing. And you know, me being German, we had, and the, the location he planted it in, right, was in the middle of, um, of Hobbiton. And it, it grew really, really tall and it became like the, the new um, party tree in a way, right? Um, and the the center, basically, where, where people met. Um, and this is a very beautiful image of for the Shire, but also for, you know, the world being whole again in a way. And, you know, me being German, we had in our ancient villages, we always had an oak tree in the middle of the village. And a lot of, you know, the, the Germanic tings, you know, where they met um, and uh, the, the, the bosses of the tribes, you know, they hold the ting there and they judge stuff there and uh, hold council there and the people of the village met and this is very symbolic so this this whole tree in the middle of a village thing and I found that so beautiful that you know Sam um, created or recreated this this tradition with planting the tree and it was you know trees are in a way hope right um, and that it bloomed and blossomed there um, yeah it showed that not all hope is lost and it's a new beginning and uh, yeah and life came back to the shire and the world yeah and uh, and another thing was that this is because this is Lothlorien which was kept by the power of the ring and the power yeah. of Galadriel and yeah. this is effectively her parting gift to the world it's not not just to Sam yeah. because after she's gone then Lothlorien will fade but the Shire will retain that little bit of uh, sort of elven magical almost perfection that, that is there which is yeah. uh, so this is this is what she bequeaths to the world as much as anything else mm -hmm. um I, I do wonder so the the belts I, I wonder whether you've got so we've got Boromir's golden belt and silver belts for the the two Merry and Pippin um I, I think of these these are probably the most boring um <laughs> of all the gifts um the 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 golden belt, I think the only real thing is that it's used to identify him when yeah. Faramir yeah. sees him yeah. sort of heading down uh, on, on this boat and uh, he's got this golden belt on that he doesn't recognise and Frodo says, oh, yes, he was given a golden belt. And it's like, okay, so it definitely was him then. Um, so I think that's the only thing there. The, um, uh, the other 
one perhaps uh, perhaps would you like to talk about the elf stone perhaps the that Aragorn was given that's an uh, did that come from Numenor originally I forgot yeah well so there there are a couple of different um there are different ver- interpretations it, uh, one of it's them from the unfinished was, tales right yeah yes and one of them was Celebrimbor had made it um, uh, uh, yeah. But it's, this was a sort of a, a healing uh, and uh, sort of stone as much as anything else. Uh, so this was um, helping, this would help Aragorn because the hands of the king are the hands of the healer. Uh, mm-hmm. So so this was yet another sort of uh, affirmation of who, um, who he was. Mm-hmm. One thing that I would uh, I would pick up on though, uh, which I I think I, until I was looking at this just now, uh, was the sheath for Anduril. So he's got his sword, the reforged sword, uh, mm-hmm. but he didn't have anything to sort of put it in. Uh, and Galadriel gave him this. Um, and uh, what I when I was just really, I hadn't picked up on before, uh, but as well as it being a really cool and really practical gift, um, it said he told she told him that the blade that is drawn from this sheath shall not be stained or broken, even in defeat. And that's when you think about this is the sword that was broken <laughs> for all that time. That's like that's quite an impressive thing. It's like saying this is not going to be broken yeah. again. That's that it will be it will be able to be used effectively forever. So this is making an already amazing sword uh, an even more magically powerful sword than, uh, yeah. than it was before. And the story of the sword is so cool itself because you know it was actually uh, originally made uh, by dwarves and then it came as a gift to Numenor. I think Telkar, who was one of the I think it was Telkar um, who forged it. Um, so it was forged in the first age by the dwarves, right? Um, and then it, of Belagos, I think. And then it came to Numenor as a gift in the second age. And um, then it went, it passed down uh, to Aragorn, which is a really cool story for a sword. Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a great, great story. And then just the, the sheath is a very, it's, it's a very wise gift. Because <laughs> it's like you actually yeah. something that he would find useful, not just like, yes. a, oh, uh, thanks, Galadriel. That's cool. <laughs> um, uh, that, we'll talk about the hairs uh, for Gimli in a moment. The The file um, of Galadriel is, however, I think yeah. undoubtedly one of the, the, the coolest gifts that's there. And yeah. uh, Mara, you were saying, does this come with some kind of foresight on Galadriel's part? Are these just gifts that, you know, with some great wisdom? I think some of them are just gifts. I think like the belts and things like that are just gifts. But there are some moments that you go, that she she kind of sensed something and i think the file of galadriel is probably one of them uh because she even gives like the little warning when when all other lights have gone and and it's like i can i can it's almost as if she could sense that when and how this would be useful um do you want to give me your your take because i i mean everyone's got a sort of a uh, a, a good way of looking at this but what's your sort of take on on this gift <laughs> Well, I, I don't think she foresaw uh, and foretold the situation that he would need it, you know, to fight off a, a deadly uh, venomous spider, gigantic spider. But she obviously, I think in general, she knows this light that or that light in general can fight darkness, right? Um, that totally makes sense. And, you know, the light of Erendil is even more symbolic because who in the end, you know, killed Ankalagon, who was responsible, mainly responsible for the death and chaining and, um, you know, well, not death, but uh, for for the destruction of Morgoth um, at the end of the First Age. So that was Eärendil. Um, So it is very symbolic. um, But I I think in general, you know, her her giving light is is also a thing of hope. Like, it is... You hold something, and and you oh, you know, okay, th- th- there's not magic coming out of something, but knowing um, the, the 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 meaning of something makes you stronger and makes your actions, you know, um, to oh, it's hard to explain what what Frodo then did, what Sam then did with it, but it was like 
her enhancing his his power and him believing in himself with giving him this light and this hope mm -hmm. does that make yeah. sense it, i think it does and i think i think the other thing i would just add for those who are unaware of the sort of the background and history of this light because it's it's a light which is almost from before time this is a holy hallowed light so if, if you cast your way all the way back to the years of the trees which is before the ages of the, the four ages of middle earth um you get this holy hallowed wonderful light from these trees in valinor and the only bit of that light that remained was what Fëanor effectively caught in the three Silmarils. Uh, that's where all of the big efforts and fights and madness of the First Age came hunting for these Silmarils, trying to get and keep these Silmarils. One of those Silmarils, long story, but ends up in the sky as a star. The light from that star shines down into Galadriel's, the mirror of Galadriel, and it's the reflection of that light that is captured. And so that, it's it's a really kind of a long, kind of very long game from Tolkien and sort of how this gets here. But this means this is not just magic light. This is holy, pure light from Valinor itself, uh, from Galadriel, who has seen and experienced that light herself. So it's mm. it's a, a, an astonishing, just kind of like a uh, really long trip from the very beginning of time, effectively, mm. in, in, and all the way to the end of this is how darkness can be defeated. Yeah, but this is more of a concept. It's again, it's not like there's a magic portion there's not it doesn't say if you you know turn the the file to the left then it does this or this it's more a a concept of um light uh, fights evil and darkness yeah yeah uh Caius ballerina thank you very much picking up a question for reflective rambling thank you i love it when uh, people do this uh lorian will fade will that mean that mirkwood will also become habitable one day um well, yes. So Mirkwood wasn't always Mirkwood. It was Greenwood the Great. Uh, and then it um, slowly got taken over by um, the Shadow, which is um, Sauron in Dol Guldur, slowly spreading his influence over, pushing further and further till Thranduil, who... Um, I'm on a bit of a downer on Thranduil at the moment, but basically he seems to have done not hey! much to hold back the forces of darkness um, until the entire forest was sort of taken over by the shadow. Um, but so um, I've entirely lost my thought because I was going off and uh, attacking uh, there, but we'll get, will Merc will become habitable one day? Yes, because at the end of all of this story, what happened was that they cleared out Mirkwood. So for most of the time when Mirkwood was Mirkwood, it either had Sauron himself or one of the Nazgul or more than one of the Nazgul sort of stationed there being in charge of stuff. But they obviously went at the end of the Lord of the Rings. And when they did, it just got cleared out by Thranduil doing his one good deed of the entire story um, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, also sort of Celeborn. So with Hashtag yes, not it will true, be. the battle under the trees, there were many battles he fought. Don't say this. Okay, <laughs> I'm being mean. I humbly take it back. Um, so uh, I, think that, I think the answer to that one, unless you've got anything to add, is that yes, Mirkwood will be um, yeah. habitable. Um, again, uh, mm -hmm. Kraken Tacker. And, and, oh, and, and, and Mirkwood had also a very, um, there was a trade route um, in the, I just forgot the name. Uh, there was a very important trade route in the north of Mirkwood. Um, and that was the dwarves use it, the elves use it, men use it. So I do think that whole region will still be of importance. The men of Dale are still alive, right? Um, the dwarves in the, in the, in, in the mountains. So I, I do think the whole area will still be inhabited because it's an important location for the for the trade routes and for the yeah yes and the bayornings uh, this sort of new race coming from beyond they yeah. all uh, they they take over that sort of land just between Mirkwood yeah. and the misty mountains yeah Crock and Taco saying, "Love this this discussion. Thank you to both of you. Thank you uh, very much indeed." 
Um, uh, e. Marty's just saying Helena with like a heart eyes emoji, which again, I would take that as a compliment to you, Helen. Um, and uh, Andrew K saying uh, Thranduil the transactional. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't wish to disagree with that. Um, let's go to a question from... Um, oh, this is the question I said we were going to go on to about the, the hair. Um, Mara Lee, the second part of that question was, I find it rather touching that she would gift Gimli something so precious as her hair and she would not Feanor. And Children of Jack Acid saying, why didn't Galadriel give Feanor a strand of her hair? What was all that about? Uh, and was it a mistake? So um, the, the, the background to this, for who, those who are unaware, uh, Feanor, who was this uh, astonishingly charismatic but um, misguided figure um, in leader of, eventually he was the king of the Noldor, he was the leader of the rebellion. Um, he fixated on Galadriel's hair, which it was said managed to capture some of the light of those trees that we were talking about before. And he three times asked her for one of her hairs, and three times she said no. So that's the sort of the way back in history. Then we get the the bit when gifts are being given out, and she says to Gimli, well, what does an elf give a dwarf as a gift? And he basically says, well, I don't ask for anything from you. And she says, well, what would you want? And, you know, and the hair, and she gives him three hairs. Uh, so what's what's going on there? Why, what do you... Why, first of all, do you think she wouldn't give Feanor a hair off of her head? And why did she give Gimli three hairs off of her head? Well, I mean, first of all, creepy uncle vibes. Hello, <laughs> anyone? Um, no, well, she obviously saw right from the beginning, right? Um, at that time, the family already feuded or Feanor feuded with her brothers, right? Um, and her grandfather was at Feanor's side in a way. Um, and so that, you know, that there, there, there was twist in the family. Um, and so I don't think she ever had. And yes, you know, especially Fingal Orphan as the second oldest brother, but oldest from, from her line, basically, so her uncle, um, he always stood behind, even, you know, even after his father died and Feanor took over, and after a lot of things, he stayed true to the kings because a lot of people, you know, um, and Feanor himself um, thought he wants to take up uh, the, the kingship and all that. So this is a very interesting time, Galadriel. We don't know exactly the moment in time he asked her, right? Um but I do think she knew all of the dealings of her family with Feanor. So that was never a really friendly relationship um, right from the get-go because he never liked Indus, so basically her mother, uh, her grandmother uh, in the beginning days. And I don't think they had a close relationship. So I don't find it strange in that way. And the second part of that would be she is from her father, you know, she is foresighted and that is a gift from her father, right? He's the clever one in the family. Um, he's not the best fighter or anything, but he's he's the clever one. Um, and so she is a bit like Finarfin in that way. And I think she maybe not foresaw again what, what would happen, but she knew that wish because she knew her hair was special right a lot of people must have complimented her on that and said you know this reminds me of this and this um and so she must know of the power of her hair so she didn't want to give her uncle this inspiration power whatever i think those were the two main reasons for her um yeah i think i would uh, i would agree i think it is I mean, fundamentally, as you say, creepy uncle vibes. He he said, you know, can I have one of the hairs off of your head? And it's like, why would she? She she we're told she saw the evil within him, or and the shadow of evil within mm. him. She didn't recognize that it was also within herself, but she did see it in him. And so, 
um it's i th i think there was a sort of a, a foresight thing going on as, yeah. as well as a, a sort of a actually well why would she um yeah. it's an odd thing to do I, th I think with gimli the thing is that he didn't ask he didn't say i would like that uh she pushes him to say well you know i'm not asking you to say what you want as a gift from me i'm just saying yeah yeah, that, and and he says, well, yeah, maybe one, and so she gives him three. So it's almost like a, she's giving him more than he would have desired. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's there's the difference between asking for it and not asking for it. And Gimli yeah. would have very happily gone away without anything uh, yeah. because he just didn't think that was his place to to ask. And it's it's also very special because we know the dwarves always liked the gems. So the Noldor brought a lot of gems from Valinor to Middle Earth, and they then let the dwarves craft, you know, gems or whatever. But I think they talk about some pearls or whatever, and I, I don't remember what was it the dwarves of Belagos? I don't really remember who it was, but they were like fascinated by, you know, they never saw gemstones like that before because Middle Earth didn't have these um, kind of uh, gemstones. And um, they they loved, you know, that, that bling coming from Valinor. And it's fascinating that she didn't offer, because I'm pretty sure she had something like that um, and he could have asked for it or she could have offered it. And I think he would have been maybe happy with that. But her giving him something from herself you know like which she knew again people complimented on her she must have heard that a gazillion times you know compliments on her hair and um then she she gave that freely as you said to him is even more powerful than if she would have given him i don't know a stone coming from valinor which her uncle or father or not father her uncles brought so yeah yeah, I think the stone links are it's, it's an interesting one because uh, Feanor made the Silmarils capturing the light of the, <clears throat> the the trees. And it's said that he gained the inspiration for this from the way that Galadriel's hair caught the light from the trees. Yeah. Now, that may be just a sort of a poetic link, but we, as you say, dwarves love all kinds of... Um, sort of minerals and rocks and gems and if Feanor might have got that kind of idea can you just imagine maybe Gimli might have had just a glimpse or an echo of that same kind of thing is that that there's a beauty in there that that he mm -hmm. could conceptualize uh yeah. through kind of like a stone or something like that so that I, I really like that idea that's um yeah, yeah that works for me let's go to um another question from Robert just got an idea for a video. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. <laughs> well, well, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to work that one up a bit. Um, Children of Jack Acid, do you get the vibe that Galadriel originally meant for the three elven rings of power to be put away and never used, but that she eventually got basically addicted to it when it enhanced her kingdom and made it thrive, so that her refusal of Fro Frodo's offer of the one ring was actually a second chance of sorts after failing the first test? And were there any bad effects from wearing the Ring of Power? Um, mm -hmm. Well, where do you want to start on that one? Uh, do you, uh, I mean, the, the the facts that we know is that she definitely did, when uh, uh, Brimbor comes to her and says, what should we do with these? Then she does say, let's, let's just distribute them far and wide. Um, but I think you have to start earlier because, so, look, Kilebrimbo forged a lot of rings, right? He trained with some rings, lesser rings, we don't know how many, what they did, whatever. Then, you know, he he forged uh, the, the rings for the dwarves, for the men, um, and then he forged the elven rings. All the other rings, except the three elven rings, were originally planned for elves by Sauron. Kilebrimbo was just the forger basically Sauron taught him things told him things but in Sauron's mind the rings were to dominate elves right that was what they were made for um and then we know what happened you know with, with the other rings but Celebrimbor himself with his intention we don't exactly know what his intention 
in in the moment him forging those rings were right because i don't think he had the foresight to to plan all this out and he didn't at that time he hadn't heard um sauron saying because that happened years later so the rings the first rings were forged in 1500 second age the one ring was forged in 1600 so 100 years later so there's a time span of 100 years and then so when sauron forged the ring you know and he read basically the ring inscription the elves heard it in a way telepathically and then they were like okay let's Put, you know, let's put down these rings. Um, so I think that is very important because Celebrimbo forged these three rings for these three, or I'm, I'm not sure if he forged the ring for Galadriel because yes, two of the other rings went down to other people in the end, but he forged the rings for elves by him by his own intention, right? So that is very different. So I don't think um, the getting addicted to it and all that stuff you i don't think that would have happened and that did not happen because the forger himself used another form of magic and had another intention by these rings so you can't compare them to the effect they had on the dwarves and and the men does that make sense i, I think it does and i think although it's not said explicitly the clear implication is that they didn't then they took the rings off when they discovered that the one ring was there and all the time while Sauron had that ring, they were not wearing their rings, the, the, yeah. the elven rings of power. And they would have put them back on after Sauron was vanquished. So um, it's not that because then they had, um, they were free from any possible influence there. Uh, so I, I think what had she originally intended to sort of, distribute them and not use them and then was tempted to i don't think it was quite like that unless you say because it's the same for all of the others because elrond was the same he then well, and um gandalf when he arrived he wore his ring so i think that no i, th I think she definitely got used to and enjoyed using the ring and its power to rule her realm to keep it uh secret to keep it uh protected to, to keep it blooming um mm -hmm. but i don't think that there was this original tug because she was not wearing the ring while sauron had it um no the interesting thing i think is um so, and uh, ring logistics is uh, is an interesting one. I, I saw Lexi, girl next gondol, just made a video about the magic of the One Ring, which I I will get watch at some point. But when when it was reclaimed suddenly and Gollum put it on Shmigol as he was at the time, then did they feel anything wearing those those rings as well? I don't know. I think that's a, that's a, a moot point. I don't think we we ever really hear that they do um it's because mm -hmm. it was not reunited with sauron and that was the original idea yeah. um okay let's um oh well i'm about halfway through i think well i've got a few more questions to go anyway uh and i always like to do a uh, part way through a thank you to my patrons patrons thank you so much uh for all of your support i genuinely can't do what i do without your support so thank you um the what i try and do is provide extra stuff for my patrons uh, as and when i can there are a few goodies coming your way soon i promise um as well as all the normal stuff like priority questions here if you do want to support this channel the best way to do that is uh by becoming a patron there's a link down in the description um let's go on to a question from uh oh actually the second part of this question were there any bad effects from wearing the ring of power um eg it says in some text that the ring increased her longing for the sea and kept her uncomfortable in lothorian do you do you, are you aware of any other sort of negative effects of this ring mm -mm. no and i do think again i think it was very different than wearing the 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 one ring like in it's very interesting. Um, I recently read uh, the Isildur uh, part, you know, um, when he wanted actually to travel to um, to um, Elrond. And I think one of his plans was to give him the ring. Um, and the temptation was so, you know, w w when they then 
you know, were attacked by the orcs. Even his son was telling him, use the ring. Why don't you use the ring? So you can see this whole how the ring influenced and that he didn't have the ring for a really, really long time, right, um, at that point. So it, and the ring wasn't at the height of its power at that point. Um, so it's really interesting how that ring worked. And I don't think this whole temptation thing again is is the same for for the elven ring like it was for for the other rings because my head canon on that is Celebrimbo had a complete different intention forging them and it was his own potion he gave into it so it wasn't evil or it wasn't temptatious because that's not what elves are yeah I, 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 but I, when Sauron not, made him forge the rings is. yeah Exactly. But when Sauron made him forge the rings and told him all these things, you know, he wasn't in his, you know, he wasn't, he didn't have a clear mind. He was just fascinated. Oh my God, somebody is teaching me all these things. I can surpass my grandfather. Um, I can surpass Feanor as the greatest smith of all. Sauron fed him with all these things. And he was, you know, he was maybe a bit vain and the Gwaith Amirdan, you know, saying, probably uh, being like, yay, te teach us things. They were Nolda. They loved to learn, to craft things. And there came this powerful, you know, whoever, Anatar, whoever he was, and he taught them things. So I do think in the beginning days when he forged the other rings and what the rings then did to the humans and to the dwarves was very different than what happened to the rings. He then, in a clear mind and, you know, being Celebrimbo himself again, um, what he did in forging those rings. So I do think they're complete. Yes. Separate. And I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah I, I think Celebrimbo, Tolkien deliberately compares him to Feanor. Feanor creates these three Silmarils that um, have yes. this immense beauty inside them, but also they cause this huge amount of hurt and yeah. terrible bad things. And Celebrimbo creates these three things of beauty that yeah. could potentially have had a huge amount of bad in them because they came from uh, the original idea of being Anatars from, from Saurons. Yeah. But actually, these three create great beauty and light and life. So it's an opposite. Whereas Feanor just threw absolutely everything to try and reclaim these three Silmarils, charged killed loads yeah. of people, charged across the continent, um, swore horrendous oaths to try and claim yeah. those Silmarils back. Celebrimbo gave his away, gave the Three Rings away. So yes. Tolkien yeah. is deliberately showing us that, that, that these things, these people are opposites. They're different uh, people. Celebrimbo seems to have actually been a good person. Uh, so I, I'm yes. uh, I'm quite a Celebrimbo fan, it has to be said. Yeah. Um, but we have got a contentious question. This is Kaius Ballerina picking up for <laughs> Callie Summers, uh, saying, don't want to start a fight, but are dwarves better than elves? Um, dwarves could wear their rings with Sauron around uh, without being dominated. Well, um, there's a reason uh, for are that. Are dwarves better than elves? Elves will obviously yes, uh, but uh, Helen, I'm sure, will give us the reason why the the dwarves could resist, other than their inherent superiority. Yes, because they were not um, God's original plan, right? So God's plan was to create this amazing world, this amazing universe, and His plan was the firstborn. Obviously, you know, I identify as an elf, spoiler, if nobody <laughs> realized that till now. And uh, the firstborn and then the secondborn, he never planned with dwarves. And when you when you read, and again, this is mainly, you know, me me uh, not being completely serious here. I, I like dwarves and especially, you know, the stories of the first age, the dwarves of Belagos and all that. That is epic. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I... I, what was the question? If they were better. Why are dwarves better? I think was the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, there, so, uh, how could they resist the, 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 oh, rings, the rings? Yeah, exactly. The That's what I want. To, yeah, exactly. So um Owlet created the dwarves and the way and who was Owlet? He was a smith, right? He was not a a warrior. He wasn't interested in politics. He wasn't interested in immortality. He 
was interested in crafting things. What do you need to craft things? You need to be very skillful. You need to be sturdy. You need to be stubborn, you know, because it takes some time. So he he put all that into his creations and that was the way they were. Uh, and then, you know, in the end, Eru was pitiful and allowed them to live, obviously being born after uh, his children arose, which fun fact that wolves were actually born before the elves in a way, because yeah, they, they, they awoke before the elves, but yeah, you know, don't tell the elves. Um, so, yeah, I do think the whole concept of their creation and who their creators were, because it's two different creators and what they had in mind for, for their children was very different. And this is why the dwarves could withstand the power of the ring, because they were not part of this concept of the world Eru created in his mind. Because let's be honest, in the end, Eru knew how all this will play out. Not every day, not every second, but he knew there will be a fight, good versus evil, and he let it, you know, he allowed it to play out, um, and the elves were a part of that, and the dwarves never were. They were not his children. So I do think this is why the dwarves stand out and could withstand um, the power of the ring, which is not part of their making and their creator didn't have that in mind and he didn't put these thoughts and feelings and stuff in in their creation uh, well i do like that um uh, but i'll add another layer as well i mean i think that the answer <laughs> to all this is they should have given gimli the ring but let's let we'll leave that one alone for the time being um the um i think that the thing i would add is that the point of the 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 rings of power is it's about power it's about uh you tempting the person with being uh, whatever they think of as powerful being that more yeah. magically powerful being that having lands having uh people to rule over and we see that this is humans easily gave into that because there were people who lusted after power the elves also do. We know that. We see that in Galadriel. We're literally told that she was wanting power over other people. She wanted to rule without anyone teaching her, without any, any advisors. Uh, that, so that is in the elvish uh, makeup, a constituent yeah. part of who they are. The dwarves, what, what does power look like to them? It's actually not conquering other people. It's actually not ruling over vast nations. It's about tunneling down into the ground, gathering up lots of shiny yeah. things and living dwarven lives. And that is what they wanted. So did it affect them? It did affect them, but it's in a way which was not the same way it affected the elves or the humans. Yeah. It was not making them want to conquer anywhere else, be in charge no. of the whole world. It was about them just living their best, best lives underground. So um, yeah. it's... Uh, they they were better able to resist, but resisting the things that other people could see is, is yeah. where I have it. And and again, you know, uh, Celebrimbo created under Sauron's tutelage the ring for elves. Men are very much alike elves in exactly what you said, right? So it makes total sense that the the dwarves who are completely different that it doesn't doesn't affect them in 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 that way because they are not similar in in. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think we're agreed dwarves are better than elves. Thank you. No, that <laughs> is no. No, 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 no. No, not true. Elves are obviously superior. First born again. Well, okay. So I, I, the idea that, well, we're not getting into that. Anyway, um, the let's go to a question from Yule Elson, uh, picking up for Kelly Summers. Thank you very much. Saying, why did the light from the file chase away Shelob? She's a weaker descendant of Ungoliant who drank the sap from the tree that the light is a reflection of. Oh, interesting question. I mean, I think that the... Um, um, yeah. Sorry. No? no. Okay. I, I, well, I was. Uh, sorry. I thought you were about to say something. Um, I, I think that this is. It is a holy light, and what happened with the trees was that uh, it wasn't just Ungoliant going and hump like that. First of all, Morgoth killed the trees, and then Ungoliant drank the sap. Effectively, sucked the life out of them. So, um, yeah. uh, what Ungoliant was all about 
darkness or unlight, as uh, Tolkien uh, put it, which seems to be even more extreme version of not light. Um, so the light, <laughs> unfriends. There, ex exactly. So we get this uh, the light, which is a holy light, as we said, and that was the thing which was um, uh, almost it blinded her effectively. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that in terms of the no. Shelob law? No, no, I don't like spiders. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, uh, let's go to a question from uh, Peter Ruain saying, trees have loads of rings and weren't dominated by Sauron. Does that make Ents the true lords of the rings? Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the Ents are definitely the true uh, Lords of the Rings. Um, like it. Uh, okay, let's go <laughs> to a question from Dan McKay. This is, uh, again, This is we, we talked about him a little bit more, Kellerborn. Uh, could you tell us about Galadriel's husband and their relationship? Uh, will the two have met already in the Second Age where the ending show is set? So, um, we talked a little bit about whether he was wise or not, but I, perhaps <laughs> I think that the answer to the direct question is uh, yes, they will met. By this point in the first age, they met uh, and they married. Yeah. Um, uh, so in the second age, she will be married to Celeborn, although they did seem to spend a reasonable amount of time in different parts of middle earth um so what's your take do you want to sort of give us your take on on him he wasn't well, he's described as wise but perhaps wasn't as wise as we might think but what's the sort of overall take on him as a character yeah so i'm not focusing on the wise thing here i do think it's uh interesting that twicking created this form of character because again i'm a big fan of numenor right and we know um, that the story of a queen having a concert or, you know, not because they were never allowed to r rule. So if there was a Numenorean queen, there were several, um, she was the queen. It wasn't like she married somebody and he then was the king or they didn't rule jointly, uh, rule jointly, they, she ruled, right? And we know... <laughs> Judging the history of Numenor, that never worked out, right? We had an, this is a really difficult word for me, usurpator, usurpator, it's hard to say it in English, you know what I mean. Okay. Um, he usurped the throne uh, from from her, basically, and then, you know, we, we had other examples. Sorry? I didn't say anything. Is it usurper? Is that the word you were looking usurper, for? Usurper. Usurper. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, you know, we, we had a lot of really bad examples of a powerful woman in charge, a ruler, and then the husband, you know, that never worked out in Numenor. So it is really fascinating that we do have this um, working out for her um, and Kilibon because he, I mean, Tolkien wrote again different versions about him where some somehow he's related to Thingol in that one version, which would make him come from a royal line, right? At least that's something. Um, he wasn't a nobody, but I, I do like the idea that he is not as wise as her, he's not as powerful as her, and that he is okay with it because, you know, that is not a concept that was known at that time very well. And it didn't work out in Numenor and many other times. I mean, you can think maybe of Idril and Tuor, but he was a human and she didn't really rule Gondolin. So, but she was obviously an elf more powerful than him or Beren and Luthien. But, okay, for them, it, it did work in a way, but they never were rulers of countries or whatnot. And she was. Um, and she came from that super powerful line, but it worked for them. So I'm I'm happy they he invented a character like Celeborn who was okay with his wife being super successful, super powerful, um, and he aided her. Like I said, he stayed back in Eregion, and you know he he kept his eye on Celebrimbo for her and all that. He fulfilled a lot of tasks she gave him. I like that. 
Yeah, and and so I we don't we don't get huge amounts about him. I think is the short answer. Um, but yes, their dynamic does seem to be that she's the go getter. She's the the real leader. She's the person who uh, achieves and does great things. And he's the kind of the stable influence by her side. And I think that yeah. that is a um, uh, that's a, a really good and strong dynamic. Um, and I think perhaps that's what she needed again if we go back to my head canon of her being actually quite yeah. traumatized by whatever everything that happened uh, and so she goes to doriath just to sort of like recharge and then she meets this person if he is like that if he is this kind of like a uh, very solid kind of person who don't I mean we never really read of him going out and doing crazy things then no. uh then you can kind of understand that she's there she's wanting some sort of stability in her life and she gets it she certainly wanted to rule herself and she if she married somebody who wanted to be the ruler themselves then that would have that caused the problem so it wouldn't yeah. work at all so uh, and yeah and who in middle earth would be more powerful and more royal than her there's nobody alive right I mean, Elrond, but that's weird because they're related. Um, I mean, even her and Celeborn are related, actually, which is also a bit creepy. Like all, the, all of the elves are related when you get to it. So um, let's yeah, not, let's not delve Elrond's too are. deeply with that. And yeah. and yeah, she ends up being Elrond's mother-in-law. So um, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Uh, we did miss a question, though. Uh, apologies, um, uh, pissed one, uh, missed one from uh, Silandia saying, what do you think of Gandalf's and Galadriel's relationship? Um, so, yeah, I think this is quite an interesting question because we, we don't see them together actually all that much, as much as you might imagine that we do, because we, when the Fellowship get to Lothlorien, Gandalf isn't there. When Gandalf goes to Lothlorien, it happens largely off camera. So really, and then the White Council meetings, we don't really see. We just have a few sort of Gandalf recounts what happens at a couple of them. So we don't see them together all that much. But I loved it when in, I think it was one of the Hobbit movies, when, when you do get this White Council meeting and you see Galadriel and Gandalf together and she said, uh, Gandalf, why the halfling? And he gives the, 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 the wonderful uh, thing about, um, he gives me uh, courage. Um, I, I think that was spot on for me as a feel for how that relationship is. We yeah. we have to remember that Gandalf, for all of his um, wonderful courage and capabilities, he, he was scared to go to Middle-earth because he was scared of Sauron and he was afraid of him. And so there are very few people who he could actually be open to who actually knew what he was about what he was doing uh, yes he had the other wizards but the blue wizards headed off east and <laughs> never seen from again uh saruman he probably didn't really trust and radagast he kind of got on with but you know radagast kept himself to himself most of the time so who actually over those long centuries that he was there could he could he talk to um, and my headcanon on that is, Robert, I do think they knew each other from Valinor because, I mean, he was back in Valinor, definitely. He wasn't in Melath, um when she was born and she lived there for, for a while. She was born like 1,300, whatever, years of the trees. So she lived there a while before they left um, for, for Middle-earth. Um, and he was there. And she was, again, she was a royal princess. Uh, and they in, they mingled, especially the Noldor, mingled, you know, um, with, with, I mean, I don't know, well, with some Valar, like her grandfather, you know, he pleaded with the Valar to remarry, to be able to marry Indus and all that. So they must know each other. I'm pretty sure they knew each other from Valinor, from back in the days there. Well, it certainly makes sense, yes. And um, there, you get, I think there are three, possibly four people that he actually could deal with on this kind of equal level. Galadriel, yeah. Elrond, Curdan, and Glorfindel, yeah. I would say, is probably the other yeah. person. Um, yeah. So uh, who else? And he didn't really have a home 
Gandalf, so no. he would he would sort of turn up, and and the idea that he had some friendly places to go to, I think probably meant a huge amount to him. And uh, similarly, yeah. Galadriel was the most powerful of the Noldor left. She was this immensely powerful and impressive person. Who yeah. could she actually look up to? Um, mm -hmm. Who else there was there who had seen and experienced Valinor, who knew what she uh, she had left? So they they had yeah. a lot in common, I think, those two. And so, Melian, uh, I, I do think both knew, Mel obviously Galadriel did, but Gandalf, I think, worked for the same Valar for a while, like Melian did, just forgot the name. Oh no, did he work for Yavanna? Not sure about that. Don't quote me on that. But again, that he knew Melian as well. And I do think she missed Melian. She was like her mother because Galadriel left early on, right? So she never we don't know of Eavan and Galadriel, you know, having a close relationship or anything. She left her father and her mother behind. And I always loved that story of Melian teaching her things, not just because of the power aspect, but because she was like a mother to her, like a foster mother uh, or stepmother. And I really love that. And I do think Gandalf being, you know, of the same cloth also reminded her of, of those times with Melian, who she lost. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So I, I think theirs is a is a really good and close relationship and a rare one for each of them to actually have somebody yeah. that they could uh, connect with on many, many levels. Uh, question from Dan McKay asking whether elves are monogamous. Do they have love affairs before they settle down? Do married elves ever separate and move in with another partner? And I think the answer is, with one obvious exception, yes, they are monogamous. They do stay with one person for all of their life. Um, the, the thing about... That was the example I was about to get. Except Finn. Oh. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I, the, um, we'll get on to that example in just one second. But broadly speaking, the thing about elves is that they are, um, they are immortal. And it's the so when they 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 die bodily, then their souls still stay, and they are bound to uh, to the planet effectively, and so they will stay there forever. So they do mate once and for life effectively. Uh, but there is uh, one example, perhaps Helen, if you could think of an example of when <laughs> this has been a bit different, that would be really good. <laughs> I have no idea what you... No, uh, yeah, Finwer, And, you know, he's the guy I love to blame for all the problems of the Noldor because, yeah, he's he's the root of all of that. Um, and he had a big problem and they're really cool versions, you know, because his wife basically had to, in front of a, you know, like in front of a panel of Valar, I think, was it even in the Mahanaxar, in the Ring of Doom? Don't know where. But there's a statue. Basically, a law was made because of him, because he wanted to remarry. But his first wife, his OG wife, Miriel, she had to announce, okay, I will never, ever take a bodily form uh, again. I'll just, you know, just just stay in the halls of Vaira and weave my tapestry and be sad about what my son and his, his offspring is doing to the world. Um, and she had to promise that so he could remarry. And this shows you that, yeah, it, it, it wasn't um, allowed. Because otherwise, yeah, they would have running 10, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, undead wives running around. <laughs> Yeah, it could get even more complicated. The uh, the elven uh, family trees are quite complicated to start with. If uh, if they started remarrying each other, then it would get very very complicated. So I'm quite glad uh, that that Tolkien didn't go down that route simply for the sake of our own sanity. Um, let's go to um, Catherine Furseth. Hi, Robert. Did the mirror of Galadriel play a part in the history of Middle Earth at any time other than when Frodo looked into it? Thank you. Um, I think the answer to this is no. Um, I mean, unless you can think of something, Helen, but my, my general feel is that she must have used it. This wasn't like a thing that she just invented for that. Um, she must have used it before. She must have. This is probably how she saw a lot of what was going on. Some people had Palantir that, that they could use to sort of see what was going on far away. Um, uh, but she didn't. So I think that she almost certainly used it. But mm -hmm. um, 
I don't think we get a mention of it unless you can think of one. Mm -mm. And I think she used it to also see um, behinds because I think her, her the realm was really close, protected and shut off in a way from, from the rest of Middle-earth due to the girdle 2.0 um, she created around Lorien. And I do think she used the mirror to see beyond the borders. That was always how I imagined her using the mirror when we didn't No, I mean, you know, they, they had people coming in and um, um, like messengers from, from, from wherever, from Linden or Eregion or wherever. But um, I do think she used the mirror for, for that, as you said, so some form of palantiri. Yeah. Yes. And for those who are wondering what the, the, the girdle is, 2.0 or otherwise, this is um, uh, Melian's girdle was what it was called in Doriath, which was that place that Galadriel stayed uh, in the first age for all that time. Um, the, the queen there, Melian the Maya, uh, she set up this kind of protective, it was called Melian's girdle, but it was this kind of protective spell around the outside of it, which hid it from enemies, kept it safe, kept it protected. And the uh, uh, when you get descriptions of Lothlorien, it sounds quite similar what was going on around Lothlorien, which leads a lot of people, and I know you're part of uh, that, I actually I am as well, feeling that probably what happened was that Galadriel learned off of Melian how to do that, yeah. and that's what she did uh, at Lothlorien. So that's what, when, yeah. when we're talking about uh, Girdle 2.0, uh, that's what, what's going on there. Thank you for explaining your chat. <laughs> I, well, I, that, I I like to think that people have they're, they're are they're more clever than us. Robert, they are more clever than us. The people in your chat. So. There are many very clever people in the chat. Do not get me wrong, but there I, yeah. there are people in who are unaware. Then I'm happy to uh, to help out. Um, but now they will know the new version, the new name of it, Girdle 2.0. Girdle 2.0, uh, make it a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> 444. Hi, Robert. Is there anything special in Galadriel's braid? Braid 2.0. Uh, talk, talk to us about uh, Galadriel's braid. Helen? Yes, uh, unless there's yeah. anyone else on this screen. <laughs> no, just, uh, sorry, I was just reading the chat. Um, well... I do think it mainly portrays why do you need a braid? You need you need a braid when this is what I just did. You know, I'm I'm ready for battle, people. So uh, we'll talk about dwarves and elves again. No, I'm just kidding. I, I think it portrays um, that you know she she wrapped up her hair because this is what you do when you go into fight. This is what you do when you go maybe riding or training or fight training she she did that with her brothers right um and she didn't have a sister or any really she had a cousin one cousin Aredel that was it all the others were boys basically um and I think that just portrays her the the younger version of Galadriel for me the you know the warrior princess um yes I think so so this is um what she would do we're told she was athletic she could match i was trying to see whether i could find the exact quote but basically she was a match for all the boys is what tolkien said um uh, it not just in terms of a sort of intellect and things like that but also in athleticism um and when she was doing these athletic feats then yes yeah, she would bind up her hair in a braid so that's the that's the the feeling is there anything particular magical about that braid no her hair was, as we said, was uh, was a thing of great beauty, and it was very much her taking on this different sort of persona. Red, just being red, it's like putting on trainers as well. I guess it's that's the kind of feel yeah. is that you're you're now just doing a diff slightly different thing. So. Um, it is noticeable in the from what we've seen of the Rings of Power, Galadriel sometimes has the long flowing hair and sometimes does seem yeah. to have it tied up in a braid, which seems to imply that whereas the Kate Blanchett version almost always had, always. in fact, I think always had it yeah. down. Yeah. Uh, so this is a sort of a, in her youth, she did this quite a lot. In her older age, in Lothlorien, almost never. Uh, but in the middle bit, 
sometimes so i think mm -hmm. that's uh, that will be where we are going with that um i've got one more question from my patrons and so now is a good time to drop any more questions into the chat we'll try and pick up a few more of them uh, as well uh, dan mckay saying galadriel sails off west in the end i think i remember philippa boyan saying to, to her that represents death, or maybe she was only referring to Frodo and the other mortals and not the elves. What happens to those who sail off west, and does it mean death in any sense? Well, we've we've answered a bit of this already. Um, I think there's a sort of a thematic thing that I would ha add on here as well, is that Tolkien deliberately chose his east and west, um, is that east is the rising of the sun and west is the setting of the sun so heading into the west uh which is what the elves were doing this is they're going into the sunset this is where th this is th uh, the end and so this is it's supposed to feel sadness it's the dying of the light it's the dying of um the time of the elves so there is a thematic death that happens the elves who are heading west to go to valinor are not coming back to middle earth and so it is it is the death of the time of the elves in middle earth is is what is happening there um have you got anything else to sort of add on to that in terms of sort of the the death idea i think i said that literally in the beginning of this chat um for galadriel it is just the end of her journey and her com coming full circle. She was born there. Again, this is very different for different elves. Elrond, for example, was not born in the Undying Lands. So for him coming there, just imagine that. I mean, parts of his family lives there. Maybe, you know, Erendil comes down from Vingalot one day and shows up and is like, hey, son, <laughs> how are you? I don't know. But, you know, it, it is very, very um, different for each of the elves departing to Valinor for Galadriel is it's yeah she comes full circle she she fulfilled her destiny she had this dream she fulfilled that dream she fought evil she was allowed back even though you know she did some some things or aided or whatever uh, your version is uh, of the story and um she she came back to to her home so for her it was not it was definitely not a death um yeah, the, the hobbits, obviously, at one point, they, they will die there. Um, and for the other elves, I find it interesting. Like, or somebody like if um, Celebrimbo, not Celebrimbo, um, uh, Celeborn goes back, he wasn't born there. So he comes with his wife to a completely unknown land, right? So I find it fascinating that for each character the journey is a different one exploring new lands for 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 elrond it is exploring a new land um so yeah i i found that a cool thought because it's not the end for some it's a beginning or a a, a mm. further step in their journey which is cool yes absolutely it's, it's not it's and i think for tolkien death is not just the sad end uh, no. there is a new life element to this that we see all the way through from gandalf through the elves and through so much else uh, so that is definitely there i saw in the chat um and for his love what... of nature and for his love of nature right yes death is not a death is just a new beginning for something else if a tree dies you know then something else grows from whatever is reminiscent of the tree so it's a very cool concept actually it is, absolutely. Um, I saw the chat after what seemed to be an hour of tree jokes that I'm not entirely sure what uh, what started that. Uh, because then, I hate uh, trees. Is it because you hate? Okay, well, um, it was, uh, did, and this is a complete digression, so I apologise. A couple of people were quoting a rage, rage against the dying of the light, uh, which is a fantastic Dylan Thomas poem. And I would just, a completely random recommendation. If you enjoy the poem, just Google Michael Sheen uh, doing his recitation of that. It's only a minute long, but it is so powerful. He's a, he's a fantastic actor, and obviously, uh, with the original Welsh accent that Dylan Thomas would have, uh, he was a very Welsh. Uh, uh, he was very Welsh himself. He was Welsh himself, um, and uh, and Michael Sheen was bringing the Welsh, Welsh lilt to uh, to it. So do do yourself a favour and do check that out. Curse ballerina. 
Yes, absolutely. Everyone should love Michael Sheen, I think. Uh, Caius Ballerina, will Galadriel still be the ruler of the elves in Lothlorien in Valinor or give up all power? If she was so power hungry, why did she not press her claim to the House of Finarfin and Noldor High Queen? Well, this is where you and your encyclopedic knowledge of elven family trees will come in. Um, was she ever the sort of the heir because Gilgalad was in the second age then after the second age the uh, what well what was the situation yeah okay so let's go down the line so Finwer first not high king because he was in in the undying land so Finwer then after him came Ferno who then came to the actually I have a super cool video about the line of the high kings of the Noldor you can check that out but anyway so after him um came Ferno pretty early on died the kingship passed to the then oldest son that was Fingolfin the second son of Finwer after Fingolfin's death, you know, this all happens in a very short time. They were not kings for long. Gilgalad was actually the only longer reigning king. So after him came Fingon, his eldest son, then Turgon, the second eldest son who never really truly ruled because the problem was he was king of Gondolin. Gondolin was a hidden city, you know, kind of problematic, but in in name, he was the next high king. Then um, Aradel, she was already dead, the sister, and it never went to girls, unlike in Numenor. Um, then Argon was already dead. So the whole line of Fingolfin, dead. Yes, they had, there, there were, um, and you could question, Earendil, actually, who was the grandson of Turgon, um, could have taken on that, but, you know, he was on a, on a ship gu uh, guarding um, Morgoth, so not happening. So the, the line then passed to Finarfin, so Galad then it came to Galadriel's line, basically, to her father's line. He was in, in Valinor, obviously, so Finrod became king. Um, the other two brothers, Angrod and Agnor, died, and the problem then, you know, Gilgalad's parentage is very weird. Um, but I think my head canon is Orodreth, the son of Angrod, was his father, basically. Um, and then Gilgalad came into power, and she, or Elrond, because Elrond stems from the older claim, basically, from the claim of Earendil. Um, who, who was his father, and he was the son of Idril, daughter of Turgon, so that was the older claim. But again, we never had elven ruler queens. She ruled, but just as a lady. And I do think that after the death of Gilgalad, time changed for the elves, and the elves understood this wasn't time for elven kings anymore. So I do think this was also why Elrond never proclaimed himself as king of, I mean, it would be a bit weird because Rivendell was just a tiny city, right? But still he could have, you know, named himself something like that, but no one claimed it because they understood that time was over and they were not powerful enough. If you are a king, you have responsibilities. You need to keep the lands clean, you know, to, to, to fight, to have an army and all that. And they were no longer powerful at that time. So I think after Gilgalad's death, the whole concept of elven kings, kingships, um, was a bit no longer valid because they didn't have the power to really fulfill that that part of king and queen and i think that is why she she never did and she was content with being the lady there yes i think so i think I wouldn't dispute any part of your family tree knowledge you're far far superior than uh, to mine um i think that uh, in my understanding, Elrond probably had the better claim of the two of them, yes. given given the fact that it does seem to go down the male line rather than the female line. Um, but Elrond seems to have no interest in um, being king. He was very happy. No. He had Rivendell. He was just doing his thing there. Um, the, the old sort of the Linden Empire, such as it was, not really much going on there. You... Kurdan was still hanging around, but there's only a few elves over there at that far side. You had 
uh, the the Greenwood Elves uh, with with the the great and mighty and powerful and wise Thranduil leading. Them, of course. <laughs> Thank you for uh, mentioning that. <laughs> Um, um, I could use other words to describe him, but I'm feeling magnanimous. Um, and then you had Lothlorien. And as you say, it was like they were separated by uh, mountain ranges, hundreds of miles. It, it was all over. The, the idea of there being like a high king at that point was actually, given the fact that the elves were very slowly disappearing from Middle Earth, it was just yeah. like, here's a few disparate communities left really yeah. so um yeah there wasn't much of of an elven nation left to be high king of yeah and you know for for Tolkien kingship was very important and this is why he often mentions good kings and bad kings there's literally nothing in between right because he wants to to tell us that he sees you know a rightful ruler a good ruler some somebody like king arthur right very you know he he th th it's it's basically you can't do anything wrong. You always do right. You have a duty to fulfill to your people. Um, and they didn't have the power. And the yeah, as you said, you know, those kingdoms were dwindling. There were not many of the elves were leaving. So the, that form of kingship what Tolkien had in mind, nobody could actually fulfill. Yeah, you know, Tranduil, but they were secluded from you know, in Markwood for many, many centuries um, already. Um, and that was a different story. But yeah, the high kingship, they were, they didn't have the power to fulfill the role and they knew that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the questions from my patrons. So uh, we'll have a quick uh, flick through... Um, uh, the chat, Carl Karsnak saying uh, Tolkien was a bit of a monarchist at heart, a good Victorian boy. In other words, uh, yeah, he did have quite a high view of if you have a good ruler, then it doesn't really matter um, uh, how they become ruler, whether they're elected or, or inherit. Um, uh, Carl Karsnak saying Helen's right, mayor of the elves doesn't sound nearly as impressive. No, that's uh, very true. Um, uh, Martin Miller saying that raises the question, did male elves have long hair like they are depicted in the films? Um, interesting question. Do you, you were knowledgeable about elf hair length? No, I didn't. Uh, the, I think uh, in the um, history of Middle Earth, so Carl's book, um, Karl Hofstadter's book, the literally last book that just dropped. I mean, dude, is, talking books are dropping, uh, you know, basically by the day. These No, just kidding. But, you know, there are more talking books than just saying, you know, you're a George R. R. Martin fan uh, than from that person. And he's dead for how many years now? But anyway... But uh, Elven Hair thing, I think, is in one of the chapters, but I haven't read the book, I must admit. So I don't know. I just know about the dancing bears of uh, Numenor. Um, I don't know. I always, you know, it came from the idea of fairy, right? So and how just coming from our Germanic myths, how they are described the way they are, or nymphs and all the, you know, that concept, that mythological concept, they always had long hair. And I think it's also symbolic because look, look at warriors, you know, they grew their hair um, and they had time to grow their hair as well. Right. So I mean, they were very old. So I would, my head canon is they all had long hair. I think that's mine as well. I can't. I can't recall. A, a, there might be somewhere anything that says the length of hair. I mean, I think the only with for the men, uh, we obviously get Curdan, who was one of the rare ones who had a, a beard, which is uh, yeah. a, um, a rare and good thing for an elf. Uh, oh, Mara Lee, just popping in. Thank you. Hi there, Mara. Uh, saying uh, for Helen and the mods. Well, uh, thank you very much. And um, actually, moderators, I've not thanked you. Uh, you would do an amazing job. I saw there were a, a few things you had to zap earlier as well. If you are in the chat, could you please show a little bit of love to the moderators? Um, and uh, Reflective Rambling saying, Tolkien Reading Day videos are dropping tomorrow. Yes, uh, this is a, a thing. For those who don't know, Tolkien Reading Day happens every year. And it, I mean, 
is what it says on the tin, basically. <laughs> it's, it's a day where we celebrate reading Tolkien. And the, the YouTubers, the Tolkien YouTubers, um, tend to do a playlist every year. Um, so uh, I think it's being hosted by Timbo Took this year, um, who was fantastic. Um, he does painting. Um, wonderful painting um uh, and uh, looks like a hobbit and I, he wouldn't be offended by that in the slightest <laughs> no uh, um uh, took on the I, name took so exa you know. exactly um i will be doing a video for that it's all happening tomorrow or in fact at some point now ish i think some of the videos may well have already dropped helen have you got a video for that I wanted, but I was very ill for a long time. So um, I'll I'll uh, keep writing. I'll I'll get back to writing videos, but I I couldn't in the last uh, month. So yes, definitely uh, I won't participate tomorrow. But videos coming. Excellent. Well, I would highly recommend that people do go and uh, check them out. As there are lots of fantastic channels uh, who cover uh, the Lord of the Rings. Um, Helen, is there anything else on the subject of Galadriel that you've been burning to say all, all this time that you just haven't had the chance? No, I think, you know, what I said in the beginning um, is my take on her. I, I love the characters Tolkien revised and went back and changed and had so many different versions because for me that means his heart was into this character right and it meant something and obviously sometimes he wanted to make the character fit the the overall narrative but I think in in Galadriel's story and this is makes her stand out because again this is a time of war this is a story about wars that are being fought good versus evil but also regular battles and for her being of such importance and aiding in the wars and being so clever and so foresightful having this friendship with the dwarves um i think that makes her such a special and cool character not just because she's an elf for me but yeah be because of because of all of that and that she is the connecting link and um yeah i i really i love that and for you know i love literature and i love greek mythology and one of the you know one of the w most well-rounded characters in greek mythology is ulysses uh, odysseus how we call him in, in german and um he had his journey right and galadriel actually has a very similar journey no, not similar in the way of what they experienced but a full full fleshed out if you know all the additional material not just lord of the rings she has this journey and he cared so much for her i do think that yeah i just love this character and it makes her one of my um favorite characters agreed i i have to admit uh i do really love the character of galadriel <laughs> Uh, um, I, I know I do sometimes uh, this. <laughs> cynical uh, about, but I, I, she's one of one of the more interesting elves. Uh, let's put it that way. She starts out with all of these character flaws, and then gets this great moment at the end uh, to just show her character growth and to show where she's at. Um, so, uh, and Tolkien gives it to her this the, the time when she resists uh, the ring, and 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 then this. Uh, so I shall diminish and head into the west, and it's like it's just that she's she's suddenly accepting her fate. It's uh, it's a it's a truly wonderful arc, and and so she is yeah. an excellent character. I do really uh, love that. Um, Helen, why don't you just remind everyone where they can find you on the internet? Well, beautiful people, you can find me literally everywhere under the Clueless Fangirl, sometimes not so clueless. And uh, yeah, I make uh, content uh, like this. I have discussions. I, by the way, we really need to make this happen, Robert. We need to find a topic and you have to come to my channel uh, and we do this. Um, but yeah, I, I do uh, talking law videos. I have a long playlist about elves. <laughs> and rings uh, and Numenor especially if you're interested in the story of Numenor I have a really long and I keep adding videos to that uh, Numenor playlist and a lot about the elven houses and clans a la family tree so if you're into that um, yeah check out check out my channel and on Twitter I tweet from Star Wars things but very often uh, I compare Greek mythology or 
currently Germanic. I read a lot about my own uh, country's mythology a lot and compare the stories of old that influenced Tolkien. So, yeah, if you're interested in that, follow me on Twitter as well. Excellent. And I would heartily recommend that you do. Helen um, calls herself the Clueless Fangirl, but is so far from it, it's almost laughable. She is an incredibly knowledgeable person. Um, and uh, so do check out her videos on, as I say, the, the Star Wars stuff on there as well, the mythological stuff on there as well. It's a wonderful channel, so please do go and check it out. There'll be a link down in the description as well as if you're watching live, wherever your chat is. I will make you disappear for um, uh, just, oh, hang on, have we just got another super chat? Um, Thank you very much. Uh, just K Moore saying, I love your work. Thanks for all you do. Have you ever run across the Tolkien Untangled channel by Rainbow Dave? I would love to hear a discussion between you two about the first and second age. Um, I have very briefly come across it. Um, I, I've never uh, chatted. He's in our... He, yeah, he'll come on my channel, by the way. Um, but he's in our... Uh, but maybe not our, on mine, just, is that... <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, he, he replies. He's a, on our Discord, Robert. So you can. Oh, his him there. excellent, excellent. Yes, there is a Discord for for us uh, talking YouTubers. Okay, I will, <laughs> I will uh, check it out. Um, I do know that it is an excellent channel, though. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Uh, see what what I try and do is is get use these uh, talking live streams to introduce people to a, a wide variety of, of different content creators as well, because there are so many fantastic uh, content creators out there. I just want and I sort of share the love a little bit. But I will make you disappear for one second so I can point at things, Helen. Uh, if you are watching this back a little bit later, uh, then appearing somewhere around here will be a link to uh, some other live streams that I've done. Appearing somewhere around here will be a link to uh, my Patreon page if you wish to support this channel. Uh, but thank you so much, Helen. You've been an absolute delight, as always. Uh, some fantastic answers, some fantastic questions. Uh, so thank you all, everyone. Take care, and I shall see you again soon.